Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jim Clemmer, broadcasting from the Center of the Universe in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And we're uh, delighted to have you join us here for a one-hour quick look at leadership and culture development for higher health and safety. So let me start off with uh, a very biased point of view here, and that is that the topic today, the so-called soft skills of leadership and culture, is the critical X factor, the secret sauce, the catalytic agent, whatever analogy you might want to use. But it really is the factor that either boosts or blocks health and safety improvement efforts. And so we're going to look at different sorts of examples. Here's one, uh, I guess, public kind of example that uh, goes back a few years now to when the uh, Columbia accident happened, which was in 2003. Immediately after that, NASA launched an investigation as to what went on. And what I've pulled here is a quote from the investigation that talks about how culture had as much to do with the accident as that piece of foam, you may recall, that fell off in liftoff and knocked off some tiles, which is what caused the, uh, ultimately the, uh, uh, the shuttle to reheat, overheat on its entry back in. And so they go on to say that some safety staff and engineers were largely silent uh, during the events that were leading up to this, and uh, that the, um, this is what led to the loss. Nobody really stood up to say, we can't make this date. It was a pattern of ineffective communication that resulted in uh, some, in the loss, basically, of the, of the Columbia. And so how many times do we see that kind of thing happening in our cultures and organizations where people are not speaking up? And when we're going to look at some of the, this tangled problem, how the, uh, the root causes are highly interconnected and those of you familiar with the field of quality or TQM or Lean, Six Sigma, know about the 85-15 rule, which basically says that 85 to 95% of the time, the root cause of errors, rework, and in our case here, unsafe practices, are caused by the system, the structure, or the process. And so another perspective on that comes from Peter Senge, who has written a lot about systems thinking and uh, he talks about how when placed in the same system, people, however different, tend to produce similar results. Now think about the implications of that, for example, for accident investigations, where we go out searching for the guilty party, trying to figure out who went wrong, when really system thinking tells us we need to be looking at what went wrong. What was it about our culture, our systems, our processes that created that unsafe act? Unsafe act? So we're going to look at this from a couple of perspectives. We'll talk briefly about defining culture. We'll look at the impact of culture on safety performance. We'll look quickly at the five failure factors, the fatal five failure factors, which uh, can be the cause of a lot of the problems with health and safety. We'll talk about pathways to culture transformation. And certainly this is going to be the tip of the iceberg here because this is a deep area, as all of these are pretty deep, but this is a, a very deep area we'll skip over very quickly. And then we'll look at what are some implementation steps to start to pull together a lot of what I will have covered on the, in the above points, and we'll get into where do we go from here, what are our next steps from here. It's going to be a whirlwind tour. We err on the side of bringing you lots of information, covering a lot of ground in a short period of time, you will get a follow-up from today, follow-up email that will link you to archive of this presentation. So if you want to come back and look at areas that we covered very quickly, plus we'll link you to other resources and materials that can follow through from this presentation. In terms of some of the technical aspects here, uh, if you do have questions, particularly questions to do with maybe technical issues that you're experiencing during the presentation, then please go ahead and, and pull down the floating bar at the top of the screen. You may not see it now, but if you put your car cursor up near the top, you can see that. And uh, that will uh, give you a chance to click on chat and type in any of the questions. Send it to all panelists, which means the panelists here are uh, some of the technical people that are standing by at the Clemmer Group. And if you have questions for me that might come afterwards, 
then you can also include it there, but um, it will will have to come. Obviously, I'll answer those after the presentation. So that's a, a quick look at our territory, where we're heading, uh, how we're going to uh, cover this big topic over the next short period of time. So let's jump right in to defining culture. There are many different ways you can look at culture. I want to give you a couple of definitions. There are lots of them around. One of them goes back to one of the forefathers in the whole study and field of culture, Edgar Schein at MIT, back in the mid-'80s. He published this book, Organizational Culture and Leadership, and he put forward this definition. And I've highlighted a few key thoughts there. It's a pattern of shared assumptions that's learned by the group. It's taught to new members as the correct way, and we should almost put correct in quotation marks, the correct way to perceive, to think, and to feel in relation to those problems, which in our case could be the problems of safety. A more recent book, James Heskett came out with this one last year. He and John Cotter have done a lot of work on culture over the last few decades. And in this book, he quotes Charles Jacobs as describing the culture as a collective story that the group tells itself that drives the thinking, that drives behavior. And again, we see themes showing up here of shared assumptions, values, beliefs, behaviors, and artifacts. Artifacts are the visible symbols, uh, things like whether a manager walking through uh, an area puts on a hard hat or not, or uh, whether there's uh, parking spots in the parking lot, reserved parking. Those are all just little symbols of what the real culture of the organization might be. And then, of course, measurement and the actions that are taken around those measurements, what we measure and what we do with those measures are very key elements of what we truly value and what the culture of the organization really is. Hescott's colleague John Cotter at Harvard has published a lot about leadership and change. And in this book, he also gets into some of the issues of culture. And, uh, and it is very complex, but boils down to, once again, these themes of shared values. And in this particular point of view, he talks about how it's our peers. So it's the group norms, the way we talk to each other on a day-to-day -day basis that really determines what the culture is. The key are the peers. So the way people on front lines talk about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, etc. And so this particular uh, approach to culture is where I'll springboard into how we've tended to summarize then a lot of this work on culture and to say that culture, this very complex concept, can be really boiled down to, first of all, the way we do things around here. So our, our norms, it could even, you could even say in a family there's a culture. Dad sits at the head and mom sits here and the rest of the kids sit elsewhere at the dining room table. We all have just patterns of behavior of the way we do things. And we would add to that then, especially in the light of our discussion of safety, it's the behaviors and attitudes that are accepted or overlooked. There's a phrase that's come into uh, discussion around all of this, talks about the normalization of deviance. So that's the part about what's accepted or overlooked. Uh, we, yes, we have these steps, and yes, we, we have uh, everybody to do with culture, but uh, we then kind of, with a nudge and a wink, maybe look the other way at times uh, or don't always uh, follow those steps. So those are accepted or overlooked. So that's our take on what culture is. Let's take a look then at what's the impact and what's some of the research showing us and what are some examples of how this soft, fuzzy notion of culture impacts the performance of the organization, and specifically safety performance. One of the, uh, the more recent, I talked about the NASA example, which goes back a few years. An example that's not as, uh, doesn't go back quite as far, is the BP, the famous BP accident, where the uh, oil well blew up in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, 11 people died on that oil platform, and of course it created an environmental disaster as well. And so there's been a lot of look at that and what caused it. And Fortune magazine had an extensive article a few months back on the whole disaster. 
And the title of the article starts to give away what they found. It was an accident waiting to happen. And here's a, a comment that, uh, that comes from that article, that at almost every step, there was a lack of oversight and operational discipline. And the pres a presidential commission noted that the whole approach to managing safety was on individual worker occupational safety, but not on process safety. So they didn't have a consistent, reliable risk management process. And as a result, the, uh, the whole disaster happened. Now that's very consistent with a growing body of work, and one person who's been doing a lot of work in this area is uh, Judith Erickson. She's written a um, number of articles and papers uh, that are published and available on the internet, uh, as well as on LinkedIn discussion groups. I'm going to pull from a few of them here that continues this theme around culture and how it affects safety performance. So she has found in one of the major studies that she did that uh, it was actually a three-year study where she looked and synthesized literature from safety and health management and culture uh, and organizational behavior and found that the way in which employees are treated is the factor most significantly related to the level of safety performance. In fact, it was the most predictive factor in safety performance. And so this is research that comes from a variety of fields that really support that kind of finding. So if we continue on with some of her, uh, her findings and her articles, this particular one was looking at Henrik, who um, was someone who's famous for identifying individual behavior and really saying, well, it's, it's individuals and how they behave that is the cause of safety problems. And she really disputes that and says that well, his, his conclusion that 85% of the fatalities come from unsafe acts has no science behind it, that that's merely an opinion, and that, in fact, national-wide surveys demonstrates almost the opposite in terms of people want to do safe things, want to follow the safety standards, and so there's a great disconnect here between what he's saying and what other surveys are saying that how employees want to behave so in her opinion, we're targeting the wrong cause of workplace injuries, that it really is the context or the culture of the organization that's absolutely critical. She goes on to, uh, to talk about how a company that cares about its employees will care about safety. Corporate and organizational culture, so the focus needs to be there rather than on a safety culture as such. It's the organization that should be assessed and evaluated not safety. Well, that has some pretty profound implications. So we can talk about a safety culture, but that's really almost isolating it and making it something separate. What we're really getting at here is an organizational culture that causes unsafe acts, and that is a different kind of perspective. And so if we go down that road, we start to look more broadly at studies, for example, like Gallup in a meta-analysis of 198, almost 200,000 employees and 8,000 business units, they found that employees who strongly agreed that they had a chance to do what they do best every day had fewer health and safety issues or problems, fewer accidents while on the job. Because when you think about it, employees don't control a long list of things. Employees don't control many of these kinds of factors, and the list can just keep going on. That those of you, again, out of the quality field may be familiar with Deming, W. Edwards Deming's famous rad bead experiment, where he would give uh, individuals and participants in his class uh, a bunch of beads. Some had rad, or maybe 10, 15% rad beads mixed in, and a big paddle that had a bunch of grooves on it to pick up beads. And he would tell people not to pick up any rad beads. Well, it was impossible. Ultimately, no matter how hard they tried, because the whole process, the whole system was rigged against them. And so here we are searching for unsafe acts, putting the responsibility on individual employees and not looking at the much broader issues of how the whole system was, is essentially set up or rigged either for or against providing safer kinds of uh, behaviors in the organization. 
So every organization has a culture. The key question is whether yours is by default or by design. So do you know what your culture is becomes the first question. And we're going to come back to this kind of theme. How do you know? You may have an opinion. You may have a perception of what your culture is. But do you have any real hard facts, any real analysis of what the perceptions of the organization and of others are of your culture? And is it by design? Because most cultures are not by design. And so let's take a look then. All right, so how do we how do we build cultures by design? And the many attempts these days, there have been a lot of work done in the field of organizational culture. And yet, a lot of it hasn't really been very successful. In fact, uh, looking at change overall at all of the initiatives that have come down over the years at trying to change culture and change organization effectiveness, up to 70% of those study of, after study is showing have failed. So we can look at the glass as either half full or half empty, or half to two-thirds of these efforts are failing, or a third to half of them are succeeding, so half full or half empty. Or we can, if we're into re-engineering, say there's clearly always as much glass here as is required. There's always many different ways that we can look at the whole issue of culture or of, of the, the stats here on um, why cultures fail or succeed. One of the biggest studies that I'm aware of on the effects of culture where it was done by the McKinsey organization, and it's a massive study, 600,000 respondents, 500 organizations, and they surveyed the, the specific experiences of 6,800 CEOs and senior executives, reviewed lots of literature, and it really was one of the largest efforts under, ever undertaken. And they were looking at, they called it organizational health. And from all of that work, they determined that there's dramatic differences between organizations who are much healthier or have a more functional culture than those that have a less functional culture. And they found, in fact, that 50% of the performance variation is accounted for by differences in organizational health. Again, we come back and say, okay, well, that would apply to safety as well. Differences in safety performance are dramatically, I would even argue, more than 50% according to many other studies that we see. So what are the, the failure factors? What are the things then that either contribute to um, successful outcomes from culture efforts or contribute to the half to two-thirds of efforts that fail? Well, the number one and of the five that I'll put up here, this one is ranked first because in our experience it is the key factor, the number one factor. And it looks at the behavior of First of all, the executive team, and then cascading down through the organization. Let's take a look at the McKinsey study again. What they find is, of course, that leaders must model, but look at this number. There's a four times difference where leaders effectively model the desired change, show what safety looks like. We can all hear the sermons, but we'd much rather see one every day. So we see you loud and clear when many times executives are frustrated that people aren't getting the message, they're not hearing, or they need to, to do things more safely, well, they see you loud and clear. They see where the uh, emphasis is. They see what kinds of skills are being built, what sorts of competencies are built. They see what sort of leadership development and how effective that development is. They see that loud and clear. Because the organization's culture very much ripples out from the management team that's leading it. So we can't build a team or an organization different from us. We do a lot of off-site retreats with executive teams. You'll see that later in our process. That's where we believe this process should begin. And this is the key message that we work through with the executive team, is that you can't make them into something you're not. It needs to start with a look in the mirror. It's the single most critical factor in how effective we are with these kinds of efforts. So one of the things that we'll do is we'll look at this chart where we'll identify to what extent are you basically giving permission for culture change, for, yeah, we should sign up for that safety stuff and improve safety, or are you taking it maybe to the level of passionate lip service 
where you're talking about how important it is, you're telling stories, you're really leading from the heart. Meanwhile, I go back to my work, continue to do my same thing. We have some clients in the mining sector that live in small communities where it's very, executives' behavior is very visible. Well, how are they driving around town? How do they put ladders on their house when they're working on their house? What do they do day to day that indicates whether they really do believe in safety and practice safety or whether at the appropriate time they stand up and say all the right words about how everybody else needs to uh, behave more safely? Well, that takes us into the realm then of involved leadership. And as the arrows show there, this is the real divergence. This is where the, 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 the fork in the road here, that if we continue to do the same thing but keep talking about how important it is but don't really do anything differently, then we're going to slide down the same behaviors road. If we're going to dramatically change and be the example, be the culture that we're trying to lead forward, then that can take us ultimately to integration where it becomes the way we do things around here. So that failure factor is uh, one of the, the, the factors that we've identified as being absolutely key and the number one. But these others then really link in and are integrated. So if the senior executive is not leading by their behaviors, then it's quite likely that there will be a lot of partial and piecemeal kind of activity that's going on because they're not really that involved. They're delegating a lot of things, like these initiatives. They're delegating. They've got project teams. They've got committees. They've got groups that are, uh, are doing a lot of these kinds of initiatives, and they're not really uh, making it happen in an integrated way throughout their organization. So, the, uh, just, so looking at how are we integrating and pulling this together, uh, Peter Drucker talks about monomaniacs with a mission as being what champions are. So each one of these initiatives have monomaniacs, have real champions who are wanting to move it forward. Sometimes they're a bit like uh, Abraham Maslow's famous quote that they're running around looking for nails to hammer on and driving forward their particular program, their particular initiative, but it's not integrated and pulled together. So if we're going to see executives involved in leading this forward, they're going to move away from this bolt-on kind of thing where it's a separate program, they're launching slogans, there's uh, values and mission statements, and they're, when they're searching for the guilty, who went wrong, they're using measurements to cause blaming and gaming to happen. So they're going to be moving on to that rather than over to building in the process, building in the, uh, the way we do things and we interweaving it with our strategy, with our operations, making core values part of how we make key people decisions, for example. Using feedback not as a stick to beat people up with, but as a learning tool that can guide our improvement and our change process forward. So this looks like some subtle differences, but they're worlds of difference. Again, when we have leaders actively leading this process forward. Well, a third area is the extent to which we really assess and understand where we're at before we start to jump in with making changes or improving, trying to improve the culture of the organization. Again, we can come back to the McKinsey study, and they found that if you haven't done an effective assessment of where you're at, the differences are dramatic six times more effective where good assessment has been done. And so it really is a good example here of where slow means fast. Slowing down, getting a look at where we're at, understanding the perceptions of people in the organization, how is our current culture seen, and how does it link together across these three areas of the technical, the management systems and processes, and the leadership or people side of the equation. And we're going to particularly break those down in two areas here of management and leadership. So management is all about processes and systems and analysis, and it's absolutely critical. Uh, in health and safety, for example, we have lots of safety systems, and those are vital. Leadership is the soft people side of the equation. So are we assessing both of those effectively? And are we uh, looking at the kind of 
environment that we might have in the organization. So, for example, looking at the, uh, we call it the moose on the table. To what extent are we having courageous conversations or potentially uncourageous conversations, cowardly conversations? Now, you might call it an elephant in the room. We've worked around the world. Sometimes it's a kangaroo on the table in Australia or it's camel on the table. We can call it lots of things, but it's avoiding those difficult conversations. What kind of a culture do we have around that? And are we finding ways to have those tough conversations? One of our clients that has done a lot of good work in this area is uh, Barrick Gold, big gold mining company, the largest gold mining company in the world. And uh, here's an example of some of the ways they've tried to have a little fun with the whole idea of moose on the table, where they um, have this little moose mascot in the Australian operation. You see beside the call boxes in the event of an issue, grab moose. And they're playing around with it, having fun with it, but using it as a way to start these difficult conversations. And by the way, using many of the different techniques that we've, we've talked about here today, they dropped their uh, lost time incidents by 75% over about a three-year period. They've become a benchmark in the mining industry for dramatic reduction in, and improvement in their safety performance. In healthcare, well, I know we have some people signed on today in the healthcare field, and we do a fair bit of work in healthcare. Patient safety and employee safety is a key issue. And here's a, a comment from one study that was done that shows that 47% of staff, only 47%, feel free to question a decision or the actions of somebody with more authority. So that tells us that over 50% of people will not speak up. That's moose problem. That's a culture that clearly needs to address. That's back to the NASA example we gave where people are not speaking up. Well, why are they not speaking up? We can try to urge them. We can try to say we have open door policies. We can claim all kinds of things. But if we aren't having those courageous conversations where people are facing the bull and really dealing with these tough issues, then we've got a very dangerous culture that we have developed. So how do we do about that? Well, there's a variety of things, that, some of which we've covered around leadership behavior. But this fourth point is really getting into looking at how we equip and help frontline people develop their capacity and, uh, and their ability to deal with or to raise these issues or to be strong leaders in the organization. So mobilizing that forward front line, again, as McKinsey found, has dramatic impact. People need to feel engaged, need to feel energized to bring things forward. Our position on this is that leadership is an action, not a position. So when we talk about leadership, we tend to talk about the behaviors of leading and initiating and having those difficult conversations, for example, and not sitting back. And so the sub-theme of that is, if, is if it is to be, it's up to me. So we talk then about leading, following, or wallowing. One of the ways of, of equipping front lines, front line people, and of looking at the kind of culture that exists on the front line is understanding to what extent do people sit back and wait and follow and hope that things will get better and hope that they will he listen, that they will get the message. So maybe they're on the positive side, they're hopeful, but they're skeptical, or they're on the dangerous side, they're feeling helpless, feeling cynical. So are we sliding down there? So we're trying to build the lead, these leadership stairs, help individuals move up and take the actions of leadership, empowering, engaging, involving, modeling on the part of managers how to lead the way forward how we can take difficult situations, for example, in our culture and capitalize on those versus sliding down into the swamp of wallowing where there's lots of blaming, blame storming. People are in pity city riding the bitter bus down helpless highway. There's a sense of why bother, forget about it, nobody listens anyway. Well, every organizational culture, every team culture has a home base here in one of these three areas. And 
it has direct links back to safety performance. If we've got a group of leaders moving things forward, we're going to see higher safety performance. If we've got a group of wallowers who feel like, what's, why bother, nobody cares anyway, we're going to have much lower safety performance. So we need to build that capacity and understand that current culture in our organization. Well, our last area is uh, looking at, uh, sorry, I'm going to skip past this slide and look at the uh, whole area of culture transformation pathways. What are the key elements that can help to start to bring all of this together and to deal with these fatal failure factors that we've just talked about? Now, as I said before, this one is a real tip of the iceberg. And I've been moving pretty quickly, and I will continue to move quickly, but this is an area where we will, there's a lot more depth that we can get into. And this is also an area that is highly tailored for each organization. So the best I can do right now is generalize and give a broad overview, but it's going to vary with each organization. Let me start by coming back to the management leadership balance and saying that we need to make sure that we have a good focus on processes and people. And so the model we use, we call it our compass model. And so here you see a symbol of a compass. It isn't filled in yet, but let me fill it in and explain the model as we go along. We're using the compass and the analogy of the compass that we, to get our direction, the kind of culture we want to build to identify the pathways that we want to follow to build a higher culture we need a couple of key points here. First, we call it focus and context. Now, I've been in way too many vernacular engineering debates with all kinds of management teams about mission statements, vision statements, values, a whole bunch of things. We really boil it down to three key questions. Where are you going? What do you believe in? And why do you exist? Those are the three questions. Call them whatever you want. Values, vision, mission. Put whatever labels make sense to you, as long as they're consistent, everybody understands them. But make sure that we have clarity about those questions. Do we know where we're going? What would higher performance look like? What would greater safety look like? What would a kind of culture we're trying to build look like? What are the three or four, five at the very most, core values, principles, beliefs, whatever we want to call them, that we're going to anchor our culture around and no more than that. Way too many organizations have these long laundry lists of 6, 8, 10, 12. The worst I ever saw one organization had 36 values handily numbered from 1 to 36 and a little booklet that they handed out to everybody. And they put on the front cover our core values. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous. We've got to get it down to three or four or five key or core values. Then we look to the people we serve, our customers and those doing the serving, our partners, internal or external. And then we go over to the management side of the equation, and we look at the strategy, direction, priorities that we set. Do we have clarity about what those are? Are we measuring and rewarding things that really matter? Are, we, are our processes and our systems then aligning and helping or hindering us in moving all of this forward? And lastly, are we building organizational capacity in the organization, throughout the organization, around some of the areas that we've just talked about, skills, behaviors, attitudes, mindsets, etc.? Well, those six areas, the burgundy areas we talk about as leadership, and the management areas, the blue areas, are the harder or management side of the equation. So we need both of these. But let's take a look at some of the so-called soft side of this equation. Well, actually, just before I do that, I'll show this chart that uh, is a, a chart we tend to use quite a lot with management teams. And this is maybe a takeaway that you want to take from this presentation, is to think about how much time do you, either personally as a leader, or how much time does your management team spend day-to-day -day and technical issues, solving technical problems, or maybe dealing with technical aspects of safety? How much time do you spend in management, systems, processes? And how much time do you spend on the leadership side of the equation? I have used this uh, exercise hundreds and hundreds of times around the world over the last number of years, and I've often asked them for a show of hands, how many people want to improve the technical side? How many want to improve the management side? How many want to improve the leadership side? And hands almost always show a dramatic 
number of people saying, I want to improve the leadership side of the equation, the soft skills. And that really is one of the key elements, of course, of today's topic and the whole area of culture, IQ versus EQ. I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the research on emotional intelligence and how the soft skills have been really made more understandable and brought to light through a lot of the work of emotional intelligence. It really is the soft skills that produce hard results. Here's one example. An international company studied their worker compensation claims and correlated that with their attitude surveys and found that where the supervisors and managers were perceived to be more caring, there was a lot less injury and compensation claims were much lower. So one example of how these soft skills can make a dramatic difference. Well, there's been a lot, quite a bit of work in the area of emotional intelligence. One of the key leaders in that field is Daniel Goleman. This is one of his books. He's written uh, about a dozen books now in the topic area. And what he's saying here, and throughout a lot of this research, is that we now have a mountain of evidence to show that there's a very strong link between leadership and climate and business performance. And this whole thing of the feel of a company is a key element in effectiveness. And so emotional intelligence really has a couple of two main elements to it. It's the inner dimensions, such as these three clusters. So am I aware? Am I motivated? Am I regulating myself? And it's the outer dimensions, to what extent I'm connecting in, linking in, building relationships throughout the organization. Well, when we look at some of this research, what starts to become really key to our discussion here today about culture and about safety is conclusions like this one from Daniel Goleman, where he's looked then at almost 200 competency models from all sorts of companies around the world and analyzed across those three categories, like our triangle that we just looked at, the technical and management and leadership, and found that emotional intelligence was almost twice as important at all levels and at the senior management levels, nearly 90% of the difference was due to emotional intelligence, the so-called soft skills. That's what builds the leadership capacity of the organization. In one of my previous books, Growing the Leader's Digest, and also its companion, Growing the Distance, we came up with seven core principles that make up the uh, soft skills of leadership. Focus and context, I talked about those earlier. Where are we going? What do we believe in? Why do we exist? Those are the, at the core for us as individuals, teams, or organizations. And then around the outside, are we taking responsibility for our choices? Are we leading, following, or wallowing? Are we having authentic conversations uh, where there is openness, courageous conversations, we're dealing with moose on the table. Are we engaging and involving? Are we building a sense of purpose and spirit in the organization? Are we coaching, growing, developing? Are we mobilizing and energizing? And in that one particularly, we look at things like servant leadership and the extent to which we are serving and supporting our teams and helping to identify what are the barriers, what are the obstacles, what's getting in your way. Remember the slides of the two long lists of factors that are beyond the control of frontline workers but have an impact on safety. Well, what can we do? Asking the question, how can we help to remove or improve all of those? Well, let's uh, move along then to look at what are the key implementation steps. This is now where we'll attempt to pull together and begin to lay out a bit of a, a plan or a bit of an approach around how you might move forward based on what we've been talking about here. So we have five key steps that we've identified to building a desired culture that begin to pull all of this together. And the first one is once again back to that focus and context discussion around vision, core values, purpose, or mission. Use whatever labels make sense for you, but it's starting with real clarity about what are those. 
and really looking in depth at the kind of culture that we have. And hopefully we've had some assessment, as I've talked about. We've had some input. We get some perceptions coming in. But it's this kind of discussion, for example, with the senior team. There are different sorts of cultures, as Dave Sirota talked about. Now, do we have a culture of paternalism, where we're really treating employees as children? Do we have a culture of adversarial? Unfortunately, too many management union cultures tend to, uh, to fall into this trap. but uh, could be one where there isn't a union management uh, dynamic, but there's still a lot of tension in the culture. This is a little more subtle. Here, people are treated as things, resources to be managed, assets with skin. Uh, one phrase that drives me nuts is human capital. We start thinking about people as human capital. Well, people are people. And where we have cultures that people become things, we have less safety. We have less concern about health and safety because people are objects to be manipulated. They aren't human beings. And so it's this fourth culture. And our whole discussion with the management team needs to be around, is this the kind of culture we want to build? Clearly, this is what all the evidence says is the best kind of culture. This is the culture that's the most powerful. Is that the kind of culture we're building? Because our culture grows from our underlying beliefs. And many times these beliefs are unconscious or they're stated in, at one end, so maybe we state it at the inspiring leadership end of the uh, continuum here, but they're really all, uh, the, the behavior is really more on the traditional management side. So let me give you some examples of that. So are we command and, cl and control, or are we really participating and participatory and open? Do we look to catch people things doing, doing things wrong? or reinforce when they're doing things right? Are we using fear and force, or encouraging and nurturing courage, courageous conversations, and cooperation? Do we focus on gaps and what's wrong, or do we look for strengths and try to build on those? Are we looking for the worst in people or trying to bring out the best? One of my favorite stories there is a little girl is out riding in the car with her mother one day and says to her mother, mother, mommy, where are all the stupid jerks and idiots today? And her mother says, well, they only come out when your father's driving. Isn't it amazing how some people just bring out the best or bring out the worst in others? So what are we tending to look for? What kind of culture are we building? Is it a culture of punishment, catch people doing things wrong, or is it a culture of coaching and pulling? The parallels here are to the quality revolution, where we learned way back when to move away from acceptable quality levels to zero defects. We move, learn to move away from blaming and ex exhorting people to improve to involving and engaging them. We learned to change the focus from individual behavior to the 85-15 rule, the system, the process, the structure, the organization. We learned that quality doesn't happen by inspection. It happens through a process of continuous improvement and that managers need to move from supporting to leading the whole process. Well, we've learned a lot of that about quality. We tend not to be applying nearly as much of that when it comes to the whole area of safety. So it's the point of servant leadership. This quotation was someone who was a, a key leader in organization saying, well, my role is to bring out the best in people. It's facilitating those people that are doing good work, removing the obstacles from their path, and bringing out that best in them. So in this first step, it's where are we going, what do we believe in, why do we exist? Those three key questions that I talked about earlier that's critical to focus in context. So that then leads us into the second key step, which is defining the behaviors that we want throughout the organization. Now, I'm going to throw up a couple of quick examples of this from some clients. I mentioned Barrick Gold earlier. One of the things they spent a lot of time doing was, and you probably won't be able to read a lot of the detail on this chart, but it's just to give you an overall feeling or flavor for how they looked at the executive or senior manager and board level. They looked at the general or site or project management level, the, the more uh, divisional level, and then they took it down to the supervisors and managers, and then ultimately down to employees and contractors. And they came up with a list of behaviors of what to expect when you're being led by one of those individuals and what's expected of you in, uh, in your behavior. So 
So getting it to that level of definition, here's another example from a, another mining client. This one is, uh, was, was called FNX. It's now Quadra FNX. And they took their four values, which you see across the top, zero harm, respect and integrity, and entrepreneurial spirit, operational excellence, and they also broke them down, starting with all the team members, what everybody needs to do across those values, and then additional leader behaviors across each of those values. And here's a third example, which is uh, Metro Retail, their um, supply chain in the supply chain that provide logistics and uh, warehousing and logist uh, shipping to a number of uh, customers. And so they identified four core values, our customer, our team, our company, and our world. And this was all part of their uh, Metro Way, we call it the Our Way programs, which really defines how do we do things around here? What are our way of doing things? So getting those behaviors defined and then ultimately turning them into competencies and training, there's a whole raft of, of um, tools that would fall out from that. We move on then to looking at our management processes and systems. And this brings us back to some of what we've covered. It brings us back to the 8515 rule, for example, saying, well, yes, we need to focus on behaviors, and we need to change behaviors, and we need to improve leadership and do leadership development and all of those soft emotional intelligence critical things. But if we only do that and don't look at the processes and the systems, we're really going to have a, a, a high likelihood of failure. So as I said before, the front line and what I've pulled out on this list, I showed you two lists before. I've reduced this list down now to more systems kinds of examples. So what gets measured, the maintenance practices, you can look down through that and see that these are systems that are clearly controlled by managers, most often more senior managers or HR or other support groups, and they're not controlled by the front line. And so if we don't look at those and understand how those impact behavior on the front line, we can do all the training we like, we can do all of the exhorting and putting up posters and trying to get people to behave differently, but if the systems aren't changing, behaviors are not going to shift dramatically or over a long period of time. So that will then bring us back to this balance of looking at the leadership side of the equation, and the behaviors and the values we've just covered, and looking at the processes and the systems side of the equation. Well, and so that's what I've just illustrated, is that process or system side. Our fourth step then is now taking all of this, but it starts with the executives, starts with managers, now it cascades down through the organization, and we begin to engage and involve frontline in leadership development. So, for example, building internal commitment, as Chris Argus says in one of his Harvard Business Review articles, it's building that commitment from within to get empowerment, to get engagement, to help employees move to the want to. I want to be part of changing and improving and developing this culture. And when we get to that stage, we see here Towers Perrin, their global study, they call it the power of three, where they look at engagement. Today everybody's talking about engagement, but they're really saying, well, engagement has three core components to it. It's getting people engaged, enabling them, and energizing them. And all three of those are critical. So it's not just here you are, you're empowered. It's giving them the tools, the skills, the ability, looking at the systems that we just talked about, and then it's understanding what is it that turns off or turns on people throughout the organization to make it happen. I'm going to show you an example from one of our clients, which uh, is their Our Way program, and uh, Our is in quotations, the name of their organization is in there. And so they start with their mission, the values, some of what we've talked about here, the description of the behaviors, what we can all do to live the values, and then they put in place and built programs for leadership skill development, and then programs for employees uh, that are experiential, 
uh, uh, classroom as well as outside the classroom kinds of activities and programs to help get into and understand the values. And then the systems and uh, the, looking at the um, management supports such as we've just talked about in our last step to uh, help with this ongoing implementation of their Our Way program. Well, our last step then is to look at continuous improvement activities and ongoing organization development. So here's some examples of that, and this is where it becomes very customized to each organization. But some examples would be culture or values audits or surveys that we do periodically. How are we doing? What's working? What isn't working? It's uh, things like our leadership processes around people, how we hire how we make decisions about promotion, succession, performance management. Those areas, by the way, are the clearest areas where cultures either are perpetuated and driven forward or where there's a high snicker factor, where it becomes clear that uh, this is just stuff that's printed on a pretty parchment paper and hung in the lobby somewhere, but it isn't really the way we do things around here. We might, in this whole area, it's ongoing skill development, whether it's for personal skills or leadership skills, or of course building leadership capacity all across the organization, looking at our planning processes and our operating and management uh, business planning processes. It's looking at the KPIs, key performance indicators, the scorecards that we use, both again lagging indicators, leading indicators, hard and soft kinds of measurements that we're uh, collecting information on the uh, kinds of improvement activities that we embark on, and how we support that and align it on an ongoing basis. So those are the five key steps. And as we start to look at, so where, where do you go, how do you implement those? Well, to start to summarize and wrap up, we begin to assess where we're at. What are our current practices? What's our culture? What's our readiness for change? That could be fairly rigorous and fairly formalized, or it could be uh, more done at a, um, a management retreat where we're looking at the culture, the way we do business, what we do, how we do, what's accepted, what's tolerated, and looking at the hard and the soft side of that equation. So that could be happening as input for the retreat, or it could be happening at the, uh, the retreat itself, uh, which is, of course, less rigorous. But this is where um, we always begin and find that these kinds of efforts, it's critical to get the senior executive team on side, get them away for a couple of days, do an off-site session, and review some of what we're coming, coming up with in step one, or perhaps what we would be doing at the retreat itself if we haven't done too much with step one. But then and critically starting to get them engaged and involved in what are the behaviors, what are the systems, what are the processes to move to that on that continuum we recall to go from uh, passionate lip service to involved leadership. What are we going to have to do to move this forward? What imperatives then, strategic imperatives, key initiatives are we going to have to look at? What teams do we need to bring into place? How are we going to implement? What's the framework we're going to put in place to implement this and then once we've got that, the third step will often follow after the retreat, which is to begin to look at all the things that are going on, that puzzle piece slide with all those different components and pieces. Well, let's do an inventory of a lot of that stuff. Let's take a look at all the projects, all the committees, all the meetings that are happening around our organization. To what extent are those connected in on what our key initiative, in this case safety, to what extent are those reflecting what we're trying to do to drive safety throughout our organization? What kind of plan do we then have that is broader and cuts across and looks at not just a safety culture, but looks at culture and leadership and the skills that we have in place that then create the conditions that improve safety in the organization? And then, of course, this becomes a circular or a cycle where we now monitor, follow through six months, a year later. We maybe do another assessment. We go back up to step one, and we begin to work our way back down through the process. 
All right. Well, that was a whirlwind tour, and I know I've gone very quickly through a lot of material here. So uh, we will, as I promised earlier, send you out a link uh, once we have archived this presentation if you want to review it again. There's lots of material on our website, blogs, articles, many of the frameworks that I've identified. Uh, the, for example, the compass model. There are 16 pathways that go down below that ice, the tip of that iceberg. There's lots of more material, and uh, we'll send you uh, a follow-up uh, that you can link in and do lots more research all over all of that if you'd like to. So uh, I appreciate you joining us here today, and all the best.